So uh, thank you, Rami, and thank you, the organizing committee, Tal and Shmuel and Gabi. And especially Gabi, it's uh, for many years of uh, friendship and collaboration. And I think in the name of, of uh, many of your Israeli friends here, uh, we are excited and delighted to see you here now. Thank you very much. And uh, so uh, uh, what I'm going to present you is a study or uh, in a very preliminary stage, uh, applying connectivity map approach to model fund invasive speech, which, which differs from uh, most of the work we've done in this area uh, so far. This is the PhD thesis of Neil Horvitz, who's uh, sitting here, and the collaborators in this work are uh, uh, Chinese researchers from the uh, um, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science, and especially Fang Ha Wang, who is um, uh, the leader of, of, of this group. And um, as you can see here, there are many logos of Movement Ecology Lab and Movement e Ecology Minerva Center and Movement Ecology Journal. And this has been my um, uh, main field of studies in the last um, eight or more years. And uh, it, uh, movement ecology applies to the movement of any kind of organisms and it is essential part of life. And uh, with that, I, uh, I would like to start with an um, invitation uh, for all of you to submit uh, your best papers on, on biological transport phenomena to this new journal in BMC that uh, will be published. The first volume is expected in early J July. So um, uh, it is dedicated to the study of movement and we have a large uh, editorial board of uh, leading researchers uh, from leading university from 18 different countries and um, um, the prospects are high and I would like again to invite you to submit your best papers on movement of any kind of organisms and uh, 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 to this uh, journal. And uh, so Speaking about movement, it is defined as a change in spatial position over time, and uh, it is um, uh, a basic characteristic of life. Uh, any species move in one uh, stage or another, and it is uh, critical, important for the evolution of life, and we see a major evolutionary uh, shift associated with adaptations for different kinds of movements, and of course, it is essential part of many ecologi ecological systems. And not also it is important for um, ecology and for evolution, it is crucial for our life and for our planet and for our environment. And uh, um, issues, may, uh, some of the most important global concerns, environmental concerns that we have to do, uh, today are uh, directly related to the movement of organisms. Uh, uh, a paper by Anna, who is here uh, today, classified these uh, major uh, environmental problems to two types. One in which the movement or the dispersal is, uh, might be insufficient, like uh, in the case of climate change and the climate shift, we are worried if uh, plants and animals will uh, move, migrate fast enough uh, in order to keep the, the favorable habitat shift. And uh, of course, this uh, mass uh, uh, habitat destruction and fragmentation, again, we have similar concern whether this will impair the movement capacities of species in this landscape and whether they will be able to maintain uh, um, viable populations and so on. On the other hand, uh, uh, we have cases of excessive dispersal in which some species have enormous capacity for movement. And we see that in the spread of, of, of pests and diseases and, uh, and, and other major environmental concern of, of invasive species. So uh, these are four of the main or uh, most important environmental concerns that we have to do. We have to deal with uh, today, and in all of them, movement is crucial. 
And uh, I would like to start with this uh, biological invasion uh, concern. And this is a very famous uh, paper by uh, Dave Pimentel et al. estimating uh, this amount of, of a cost for uh, USA uh, economy per year by uh, an alien invasive uh, uh, species. And uh, in China, uh, which is a, one of the largest uh, agricultural um, uh, uh, economies in the world, uh, we have uh, about 16% um, of the land of, of, of China is uh, dedicated to agriculture, and uh, the gross production is, uh, is uh, about 400 uh, uh, billion dollars in 2007, in the same year, uh, approximately 8% of all ag uh, Chinese agriculture was infested by weeds, insect pests, and plant uh, pathogens, and, and the cost was about $20 billion. Uh, it is a major concern in China and other places in, in the world. And uh, it is actually um, predicted to be just in the beginning of, the, of a much larger uh, 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 problem. This is because uh, China has a very low number of invasive species in comparison to its area and to uh, the size of its flora in compared to, to the USA, for example. Uh, so it, it's not there yet. And also, relatively high proportion of early invasive uh, uh, stages, species in just in the beginning of the invasive uh, 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 process, which uh, can be understood because China opened to the world just not very recently. And we know that human mediated disposal is responsible for most of the, of the major uh, uh, um, costly inv invasions in the world. And uh, as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, paper, in the title of this paper, uh, it is uh, closely related to uh, uh, the rapid uh, development in China uh, economy and, and, and higher uh, places of higher economy have more invasive species. And so this is going to be a major problem. It is, it is already a very big problem. It's going to be even bigger problem in China and for the world. And this was a very big motivation to work on this uh, field. And this is uh, our collaborator, Professor Fang Hao Wan. And he's in the Chi Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences. And, uh, and he has published lots of books on this. He's one of the main authorities in China on this, uh, on this subject. And um, they've done lots of work on invasive species and management, and most of the work is still, it's quantitative, but, but more descriptive and, and not uh, without any use of models to understand the dynamics, the processes, and, and so on. So this is just an example of, uh, in this book, there's a chapter about the, the, the major invasive species, and one of them is this uh, uh, golden road, so we have data on the occurrence of these species in, in different districts of, of, uh, of China. We have uh, uh, some very rough model on, on uh, habitat suitability of, of these species, which means it can be well, almost anywhere. And, uh, and, and you see that the data is quite, quite sparse. And, uh, and, and the uh, motivation uh, that we have is, uh, should be understood in, in terms of this uh, general uh, uh, conceptual model of, of invas uh, the process of invasion, which uh, uh, starts quite slowly with the introduction. It's mostly uh, um, extreme uh, dispersal by humans, uh, but then many species do not establish after there is a time lag, as you can see here, but then after the first population established, we have the spread phase, and then we have the high uh, um, uh, invasive uh, cost and, and so on. So it is conceived that, uh, that the most efficient way to stop invasion is this in the early stages is prevention. And then there's uh, 
actually not much you can do with this when, when a species is highly invasive and occurs in high abundances all over. However, if you look at the at, um, um, uh, models or reconstructions of, of spread of invasive species like this lionfish here, here that started near Miami about uh, 20 or so years ago, um, you can see that uh, uh, along this process there were always new places that were invaded in the beginning and then maybe if we have tools to predict this, this uh, invasion then we can get back in time, okay? To in this particular place, to the to the to the opportunity to to prevent this this invasion, and in, in a way, it's like shifting the time back in in space, right? And 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 trying to combat the the in, in invasive uh, process. It's not as simple as I'm uh, 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 trying to describe this, but it's the general idea that it's not a lost battle, but still in in in. Uh, uh, several places we can we can uh, cope with that, and for that we need modeling. We need um, uh, tools to to understand the the, the process and predict uh, uh, the dynamics of this process. So, if we have a model-based uh, management plan, we want to reconstruct reconstruct the historical uh, spread uh, to model the uh, uh, the spread that is mediated by multiple rather than a single vectors. And this is a, a growing recognition in seed dispersal research. Uh, identified environmental correlates for this spread and then repeat this, uh, these three steps with some sampling data from sampling, uh, not only from the literature or from embryum and so on. And then uh, identify sensitive areas and likely invasive pathway in order to guide the uh, management uh, plans. So I'm, I would like to start with the uh, seed dispersal by wind because this is the, the um, uh, probably the most advanced uh, um, uh, type of dispersal uh, in modeling, and we've done quite a lot of work on that. So uh, the seed is here, the uh, dispersed by wind and it has some adaptation to facilitate dispersal by wind and you can imagine that we can um, at least simulate the trajectories of the seeds and, and then uh, the seeds are, are dispersed to uh, uh, selected for dispersal traits to find establishment opportunities in time and space and we know that uh, the uh, release is not random but it is in many cases uh, selected to, to match the, the best conditions for either uh, dispersal or establishment. So um, this requires uh, um, treatment by mechanistic models and my own journey in that started with my PhD and uh, with a very simple mechanistic model of seed dispersal. And then uh, I came to Princeton with Simon and with Ronnie and with Gabby uh, we did uh, uh, um, some uh, uh, much more sophisticated work on modeling of sea dispersal by wind. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the next uh, step uh, in even more sophisticated models, larger dissimulation uh, by Gil Borel, uh, supervised by Ronnie. So what you see here is a process of a higher and higher complexity. We get more and more sophisticated uh, models. We understand much better the mechanism of seed dispersal by wind, where in the canopy we, we expected uh, uh, hotspots of long distance dispersal and, and so on. But uh, on the other hand, these tools are becoming uh, uh, more difficult to handle. We need to run, to run the model, the ruffles models for, for weeks in order to simulate a uh, uh, quite short uh, time of, of dispersal. And what we really wanted is something that, that will shift us back to the simple models, like the phenomenological models, like, um, like Gaussian or like uh, uh, exp negative exponential that we know are not good enough to describe dispersal, but they are simple and therefore can be applied for long-term and, and large-scale processes. And the uh, uh, breakthrough was this uh, uh, world uh, uh, model that uh, by the people here, by Gabi and Emil Carré. And this is the, uh, the paper published in AMNAT in 2005. 
And this was, uh, uh, for me, a victory because after all this getting more and more complex, uh, we, uh, we, and Gabi and Emil Carré uh, were able to come up with this inverse Gaussian model that is as simple as any other two-parameter model, but the two parameters, the scale and shape parameters here, can be derived from parameters that we can really measure, go out and measure in each spe species or each population. So we can know the tree height, the, the, uh, where in the canopy the seed are released, what is the uh, seed terminal velocity, the wind parameters and turbulence and so, so on. So this is a model with uh, parameters that are not synthetic but can be estimated and we can plug in to species and scenarios and, and say this is uh, the best we can say about seed dispersal by wind and, and at the same time, it will be fast enough and, and efficient enough to run uh, our models for a long time. And one of the um, uh, biggest motivation for that is to, to understand the uh, uh, migration of, of trees or windy surface trees in, in climate changes. As you know, uh, these prospects of, of uh, kilo several kilometers per year in, in, in the next uh, uh, century or this century uh, has been shifted to an orders of, of hundreds or 500 meters per year, depending on the, on the biome. But in, it is in the scale of a few hundred meters per year, the, the expected uh, climate change. And one of the ways to model that was the invasion by extreme of Jim Clark and, and colleagues. It's simply uh, uh, assuming that the furthest dispersed uh, uh, individuals determines the, the rate of spread and this individual itself grows, uh, produces seeds and then the next, the next generation we have again the furthest extreme and this is the fastest, it's the upper bound of, the, of spread velocity. So we um, introduce a mechanistic uh, version of this, of this model it's again the same principle of this long jump, but, uh, but instead of plugging the two TDT with the parameters that can be quantified from seed drops that you can place, I don't know, up to 100 meters, we uh, estimate wild, the wild kernels from, uh, from these uh, parameters that you can measure and, and feed to different uh, species. And this is a sensitivity analysis of the effects of the different parameters on the rate of spread. As you can see, the most important one is maturation age. The earlier trees uh, uh, produce seeds, the faster the spread of this, of this uh, species. And then uh, the post-dispersal survival, the, the, the higher the survival, the, the faster the spread. Uh, the lower the seed uh, falls, remains more time in the air, the faster the spray, the higher fecundity, and the stronger winds, uh, the, the uh, uh, trees are, are dispersing uh, faster. And uh, so here, here I, I want to illustrate the, the strength of this uh, mechanistic model. Because not only you can plug it to different species, you can, you can uh, describe different uh, uh, projections with this model. For example, in the Duke phase experiments, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, first results was the CO2 enrichment leads to a twofold increase in fecundity and 7% uh, uh, earlier maturation. So you can uh, uh, add to the model this component and you can also add the change in the wind speed. So in different uh, places in, in North America, wind speed will increase or decrease. So you can uh, implement in the model all these projections and, and ask the question whether a typical tree or different real uh, tree species will uh, be able to cope. What are the expectations? If we have higher maturation, then, then they, they should uh, uh, spread faster in, 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 in the future. We don't know much about uh, survival and changes in terminal velocity, but in fecundity, higher fecundity means faster spread in the future, and uh, wind speed depending on, on the region. So if we use that for a typical wind dispersed uh, tree with some average parameters, you can see that the spread rate of about 200 meters per year, which is what we, we 
should expect in the future, in the next uh, uh, 50 years or so, uh, are achieved only when the survival is ridiculously high, which is almost one, okay? And when the old seas are released in very, very strong winds. So this is not very uh, a visible scenario. Most of the cases are somewhere here, and here the, the expectations are, uh, are much lower. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm accumulating. Okay, so these are different species, and again, you see that the, the, the different, uh, um, uh, most of the species will not reach this, this, uh, uh, these high rates, and only few of them, and in very uh, uh, particular uh, conditions. So I'm going back to this motivation and ask whether we can use WALD to, to uh, uh, um, uh, simulate uh, uh, invasive species in China, and the uh, uh, probably not, because uh, we have a very good model for wind dispersal, but what about dispersal by other vectors? Uh, it's still under development, and what, what you do with uh, a sequence of events that, that uh, a species is dispersed by multiple vectors throughout the, the process, that this is quite difficult to model with the dispersal kernel approach, and then how you incorporate spatial heterogeneity in a especially explicit manner, it's, it's uh, difficult, and how you do that for very large areas, and I will illustrate this problem if I have some time. So uh, we are taking the, what is called the connectivity map approach, so it's very um, intuitive. Uh, these are patches of, uh, of suitable habitat, and these are areas that, that are classified as by the uh, level of resistance for from, from movement, and if they are less resistant to movement or least cost uh, trajectories, they, they, uh, these areas are more connected. So we have, we have this uh, connectivity uh, map. Uh, the main concept is that we can quantify the spatial variation in landscape resistant to movement, and we can attribute this to some environmental uh, vari uh, variables with some stochasticity. And uh, for animals, which are the vast majority of application of this approach, you assume that what they have the same preferences for movement and, and for uh, other parts of our habitat selections, which is not very much the case. I'll skip that for, for plants or, or possibly dispersed uh, organisms. And, uh, and especially this is problematic in, in these cases because what we have is, uh, for, from China, for example, is a biome record. So you have, I don't know, 50 uh, biome records over the last century from all over uh, 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 China. And you know that if the species is there, so probably the habitat is good for the species, but how we get there, how we move from this uh, point in 1950 to this point in 1960, you really uh, have no information, so you cannot make this assumption and you know they are dispersed by wind or by water. It's not necessarily and often not the, the typical uh, establishment site. So uh, what uh, we really need to do is to um, modify uh, the, the assumptions and, and, uh, and assume that the presence data reflect the conditions for establishment and we need to model uh, uh, in a more uh, um, uh, data pool way the, the, the uh, process of, of movement and uh, still uh, trying to do that mechanistically by assuming that we understand how water flows, how animals move and, and, and so on. So uh, uh, we can uh, probably uh, um, address this challenge with this, uh, this approach and this is inherent in this approach that you can do it in a spatially explicit manner but this challenge is uh, very difficult uh, because we have uh, uh, two points, say, one uh, thousand kilometers apart, and uh, and you need to understand the process that brought uh, the movement process that that uh, connected. And uh, w when you do it with dispersal kernels, what you have is a dispersal kernels that rapidly drops within few tens of meters. And you need to apply this for, for, for much larger, orders of five or, or orders of magnitude larger uh, areas. And uh, this is a challenge that Neil is trying to resolve now. And 
I'll very uh, 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 rapidly run through this. The idea is to use uh, uh, bicarbic interpolation in which you, um, you, uh, you start with a certain uh, size of the grid and look if, you, if, if uh, um, a higher resolution or, or, or division of this group gets, gets better results and if not, then you uh, uh, classify this, this uh, grid as, as, as sufficient for our proposal. So you see this huge area, we don't need to, to, to div uh, divide this huge area. It, 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 it doesn't get the predictions better or worse, uh, but it does so in the, in, uh, near this, the, uh, these places. So that's, that's the, where we go. We still do not have results, but we are trying to uh, uh, develop uh, this approach and uh, Neil is here and uh, you will hear his uh, lectures I guess in a few years and uh, uh, I guess this is it. Honey is looking at me and I will, <laughs> and I will end here with uh, uh, lots of thanks for my uh, students, my wonderful dream team uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, my colleagues and, uh, and funding agency and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ryan, because you have been so nice and completing. I'm going to give you one minute of my time. So, for a question, <laughs> anybody? All right. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, there is one from. Uh, Real quick follow up on the question of Ignacio: um, If invasions are, are so ubiquitous, does that impact our systems? Well, you know, if you take a system which has been somehow optimized. But if invasions are ubiquitous, wouldn't that imply that, that we're not at an optimal condition? Well, uh, in terms of natural selection, you can say that the natural selection will of opportunities for different species to adapt to different environments. But if this species has evolved in, in another continent and the likelihood of this species to reach another continent is so small, then human mediated dispersal generate new you know, new opportunities, new uh, rules of the game that, that I don't think it's not optimal, but it's, uh, but it's now changing the, the players and where, where they are on, on Earth. Interestingly, philosophically, but uh, uh, you know the, the point that Ignacio is making, I think, is a more of a, is an assessment of a state situation at a given time. Okay, so at a given time, you have an optimal solution that has been reached. That doesn't mean that it cannot evolve. Okay, you can constantly have a modification, and I think that the type of work that, uh, that the RAM is doing is nature tends to look over and over to optimize even more the system from maybe the local or the regional to the global. And that would imply, in fact, okay, those are transport, I think. So another way to look at it. You know, there is, a, there is a, 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 the change spatially and in time, and the time scales are very much involved in those things. And on the longer time scale, you may find, you know, not optimal situations, especially in a changing environment that is changing whether or not, you know, the current situation is like, like it is right now, because the, the planet itself is changing no matter what. Okay, so you never, you can reach at the time scales of years or decades or whatever it is, some equilibrium and some optimum. Nevertheless, you could still have a change, okay, over time scales of thousands of years that the ecosystem could adapt to, or tens of thousands of years. Uh, I would like to add two things to Ignacio. I think that uh, really uh, uh, describing a uh, very simple, and probably universal laws like these power laws, I think it's very powerful. Uh, I would like to see more studies that explain why we have that from a mechanistic perspective and not just putting data points and saying, and saying yeah, it's, it's fits a uh, power. Yeah. Completely, I mean, they are very well established in your morphological law. I, I, that, question, your mor that question in your morphology is, is torn. I've seen, and, and, and we could talk about years about that, you know, but it's done. Now, in ecology, I am with you. That has to be explained. But I like the, the comment of Ronnie. 
you see, it's, it's not a search for something that may be not be attainable. I mean, it's like saying, you know, Nietzsche is some Nietzsche, therefore the neutral model doesn't play any role. Come on, give me a break. The neutral <laughs> model can be useful for many things. Also, you know, we, they are not truths to universal principles. They are. If you are in a steady state closed system, thermodynamics tells you maximize entropy. And if you don't believe that, you will get an Nobel Prize very soon. <laughs> now, this is not an open, a, a closed system. It's not in a steady state. What is in doubt here is the universal applicability of, of, of maximum entropy production, which, by the way, to a college of hydrologists is maximum assimilation. I mean, we have used that in the past. And the example I showed there was not fitting. I mean, the Rio Salado, mm -hmm. maximum assimilation, now what he says is correct, what Ronnie says. It's a present state situation. And that's probably the reason why the ground state in optimization is never attained. You go through feasible optimality through simulated annealing, in my opinion. All right. Thanks, Ram. I contributed two minutes of my time. <laughs>